about 15 people online. Hey, come on in, please. Um, and uh, before I turn it over to our speakers, I just wanted to see if anyone uh, in the group online or here has any, any updates or any kind of news to share with the group. And if you want us to hear you, you have to unmute yourself or use the, the chat function in, um, in Zoom. And by the way, can you guys hear us online? <laughs> Give me a sign, please. Hey, here's, here's oh, Steve. Yes. yes, people can hear us? Yes, we can, yes. Super, great. All right, so if there, if there are no updates, uh, then I will turn it over to, to Michael um, and CISO. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. My is Michael, is Michael Gerges, and I'm the founder and CEO of CISO. You may have should to I turn mute up. myself? Yes, you should mute right. yourself. I'll mute myself. Um, so just to give you a, a quick background on myself, I went to Stanford undergrad and studied economics and did my thesis on labor markets. Uh, I worked in the White House doing the education for employment work, as well as financial regulation and working on the housing market right after the recession. And then I worked in consulting, uh, doing a lot of vocational training and education work as well. And then four years ago, I joined an education startup, which was a labor marketplace. Uh, it was connecting students and tutors 24-7 on demand. Um, so labor is something that's very important to me, and, and uh, I'll get into how I started this company. But essentially, I'm building a labor marketplace for seasonal workers. So industries that rely on workers for a specific period of time. Uh, let's see if this works. Uh, so some of these industries are agriculture, construction, shipping and packaging, food and hospitality, forestry is another one. And together they spend about a trillion dollars on labor. Um, and a lot of that labor is hard to find now because these are low and semi skill work that a lot of Americans are not doing. And, and you're seeing similar issues in, in Western countries throughout the world. So the UK with Brexit has a lot of Eastern Europeans on their farms and now they're thinking about how are we going to find that labor if uh, you know, the, the, the border situation becomes different. Uh, Japan also has this problem. So, uh, yeah, so like I said, a lot of this reliance is because uh, it's a reliance on foreign born workers. So in the US, uh, there's two job openings for every job seeker in agriculture, and there's four to one in California, which is the biggest market. Uh, and more than 50% of America's agriculture workers are undocumented immigrants. The number is probably much higher. It's kind of hard to track data there. Uh, and the, the problem is similar for construction. So housing prices have been going up partly because uh, labor is going up for, for, the, for uh, residential housing. So the first product that I'm working on and for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on agriculture. Uh, so there's two visas that I'm looking at. Uh, the first is the H-2A visa and the second is the H-2B visa. The H-2A visa uh, is an agriculture only visa that's uncapped. Uh, so it, uh, it's been around for over 50 years and there's no limit on how many workers you can bring in. Uh, whereas the H-2B visa is capped at 66,000 per year. Uh, and so right now there's over half a million job openings in agriculture and about 250,000 of them are going to get filled through seasonal workers on this visa and the remaining 270,000 are going to be unfilled and that's about 5.4 billion in missing wage spend so spend that, that farms would actually like to spend on labor but they don't have access to that labor uh, so how do you traditionally solve a, a labor shortage uh, it's similar in engine in uh, startups as it is in seasonal industries so the first thing you try to do is you increase wages uh, so if you can't get an engineer in San Francisco for 100K, you offer them 150K. Um, now in agriculture and in a lot of these seasonal industries, it's very difficult because of the rise of the gig economy. So and because the employment rate is very, the employment rate is uh, very high right now. Unemployment is very low. So why would I work on a farm for $20 an hour when I can drive an Uber and make $18 an hour? It's much easier. Uh, so so this like physical labor is much more difficult to staff right now. The second thing you do is you say, hey, can we automate this work instead of just hiring labor? Um, most farms would agree that we're five to 10 years away from that actually having a, a sizable impact on the amount of labor that they need. So there is technology emerging that's crop specific, but right now it's cost prohibitive and, and farms and even construction companies are slow to adopt that type of technology. The third thing you would try and do is relocate your operation to another market to overseas. So in San Francisco, when you can't afford engineers, you open up an office in Utah or in Texas and you can get someone at a you know at a better better uh, wage. 
so there has been some movement towards um, moving operations to Latin America and Mexico in the U.S., but some of those crops are sold at a lower price than if they were grown here. And then there are tariffs that have been uh, that have been added to Mexican tomatoes, for example, 40% tariffs. So even that hasn't worked effectively. So the last thing that uh, that, that farms are going to is, is relying on foreign workers through these guest worker programs and these seasonal visas. And that's really the focus of, of what I'm building right now. Uh, and how that industry looks today is you're working with labor contractors. Uh, they don't have any service levels. Many of them don't even have websites. There's no transparency on the process. So you don't know if a worker is going to show up on time if you request 50 workers and you get 30. Um, and the entire process is done manually and it's very cost prohibitive. So a farm labor contractor can charge up to 50% on top of what the worker gets. So if a worker is coming for four months and getting $10,000, the contractor might get $5,000. Um, and so that just makes costs really high for the farm and they don't prefer that process right now, but it seems to be the, the one that they're reliant on. So they're in a very tough position. Um, so what I want to do is automate and scale the H-2A visa program. Uh, I think this is the most effective way to address the agriculture labor shortage in the U.S. and also for these other seasonal industries. Um, just taking a step uh, to the side for a second, the H-2A visa is what I'm focused on. My, my thesis is that the H-2B visa will become uncapped uh, within the next two to three years. Oh, uh, what's so, the difference between the two? So H-2B is everything that's seasonal that's not agriculture. Uh, I see. H-2A okay. is only agriculture. Okay. Now, the H-2B visa, like I said, is capped at 66,000. They do 33,000 per uh, half year. And this year, we hit the cap in March. So President Trump expanded it by 50% because construction lobby was saying, hey, we don't have any people to build, to work on your Mar-a-Lago, to work on. <laughs> right? um, so every year, they're expanding it, and they're going beyond the cap. So it's just a matter of time before they say, hey, you know what? If we're cracking down on undocumented workers, and the visas aren't enough, then we're gonna to have to remove the cap like we've done for agriculture. And so that's what I'm banking on as like a growth opportunity. But right now, I'm just focusing on ag. So uh, the first question that people ask is, okay, well, you're getting into immigration law and immigration work, and this is a hot topic in the US, and there's a lot of different opinions on this. So, you know, is, is, are, you in a, are you in a dangerous regulatory position? Um, and so the interesting thing here is that while broadly immigration reform, there's not a consensus on what it will look like, there is no one on the right or the left that's saying, hey, we got to limit these visas because this is a legal process that has existed effectively for many years where workers are coming in legally. We have a record of who they are, what work they're doing. Um, and so no one is saying, hey, we got to get rid of this. Everyone is saying, oh, sorry, the debate is for on the left, the Democrats are saying, is there a path to citizenship for these workers? And on the right, they're saying, let's reduce the regulation of these workers. Either way, the visa is going to exist. It's just a matter of um, you know, their long-term status in the US. Uh, so there's three bills in the House right now, uh, which are looking to essentially make it easier to get this visa and potentially to extend the length of the visa. So right now, uh, an H-2A visa can be for up to 10 months. Uh, there's one bill that wants to bring it to three years. Um, and that's the one that has bipartisan support. So Democrats and Republicans have both sponsored that bill. Uh, there are a few other bills sponsored by Republicans that are more focused on reducing the regulatory housing requirements um, and expanding the industries that can use this visa. Yeah, actually, uh, Julie Pearl, who's, uh, who's one of the preeminent immigration um, law experts, uh, she's on the call. and. Um, she said, uh, yeah, she can confirm that the, the H-2A visa is the only one that's likely to see expanded numbers in the current political environment. So, yeah, oh, she can. <laughs> not, not H-2B. You up. <laughs> hey, Julie, there you are. Hi, stacking you up. Yeah, did I quote you accurately? <laughs> you did. <laughs> so, Ju Julie, do you have a hunch on if you think H-2B is going to change? Uh, HTML may as well. Again, anything that is also used in construction uh, yeah. is going to be good for your program too. Cool. Happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a little bit about the competitive landscape. So uh, this is a highly fragmented industry. So the top five players uh, in terms of labor contractors have 2% market share. The top 10 players have 3% market share. There is 10,000 registered farm labor contractors, 70% of which are individuals. 
just uh, just for definition's sake, a farm labor contractor is somebody that recruits and brings in workers to a farm. They may or may not be the employer. It, they do not need to. Uh, they do not need to be bringing in foreign workers. So this includes people who are finding people in California. Um, but like I said, it's extremely fragmented. And that's typically, you know, a good sign for when if you're trying to disrupt an industry. Uh, the other thing is that it's done entirely manual. So there are a few forms that um, that have APIs and can be submitted digitally, uh, but most of the stuff used to require physical uh, signatures. And would have, and you'd see these contractors who are usually former farmers and are not tech savvy people printing out hundreds of papers and going to all the different stakeholders and getting them signed up. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to shift towards. And about a month ago, actually, after the day I had a call with Julie, um, the Department of Labor released uh, proposed new guidelines to digitize the entire process and to require or allow require digital submission and allow e-signatures for everything. So what I'm building may become the standard soon. Uh, which would be good for me because it would be hard to automate something that requires physical signatures. <laughs> uh, so how does how does uh, my model work and how is it different from uh, traditional labor contractors? So first is, the, and, I, and I'll show you guys a demo at the end, the farm requests workers via an online marketplace. So this doesn't really exist at, in any capacity right now. Right now you're calling someone and it's relationship driven. So you go online and you say, hey, I need 100 workers to pick blueberries on Michael's farm from January 1st to June 1st. And from there, and then I'll ask you a few more questions. And from there, uh, I go and search a database of workers that I've created through partnerships with growers in Mexico and Latin America. And I say, okay, it looks like on those dates, we have workers with that exact experience that are interested in going to California. Some are maybe only interested in going to Arizona because they live close to that border. Um, and then I'm pre-screening and training these workers and there's a really and, and training is a very interesting concept in this because seasonal workers are traditionally not trained. The reason they're not trained is because you don't know if you'll ever see them again. You might not even know if they show up uh, if you're applying for the visa. They might not get it. Um, but my thesis, and this is kind of there's a very interesting case study from uh, an HBS case study on Nature Suite, which is the largest tomato grower in the U.S. or in North America on how they invested in wages and training of workers and how that long term they have higher margins than anyone else in the industry. Um, so the two things that farms care about are price and quality. Um, so I want to train workers on the exact uh, requirements that these farms have. So that means not just training them on how do you pick a tomato, but uh, pesticides, what's safe and what's not safe. What's the regulatory environment like in the US for workers and, you, and that allows the farm to not get in trouble later for, for because their workers aren't following the regulatory process that they're not aware of. Um, so investing in training, investing in finding workers that have the right crop experience, and then matching them with those farms. So kind of having a matching algorithm there, and then taking that visa process and automating the entire thing. So automation, you know, from day one as, as a prototype is very much taking as little information as possible from both the farm and the worker and pre-filling the forms. And then over time, I want to be developing machine learning to, to predict what are you going to need based on previous yields, based on what's happening in the markets to suggest, hey, you should be growing X, Y, and Z, you know, this much of this, and, and these workers will be available then and, and just kind of take more and more of the process and put it online and, and, and uh, build technology around it. Uh, and then lastly, I want to be selling uh, auxiliary products and services to the farms. So they don't go online very often to purchase things. But if you are now getting your biggest uh, problem solved, which is labor online, then why not purchase other products and services and get uh, performance data and potentially data on yields and fertilizer and seed pricing. Um, so there's, there's only one other tech company that's really focused on this audience, which is Farmers Business Network. So I think there's an opportunity there to kind of just add more to what farmers are getting online. And then on the worker side, um, 30 to 40 percent of the Mexican economy is remittances, so money coming from abroad back to Mexico. Uh, and they're using services like Western Union, which charge 10 to 20 percent fees. Uh, and so uh, I want to be using all of the blockchain people in the room, uh, Bitso, which is Mexico's biggest Bitcoin exchange, uh, to be buying and selling Bitcoin in the background and getting a better rate than working with a traditional bank. So basically creating a remittance service that's blockchain enabled. And some of you guys might have feedback for me on whether or not mm -hmm. that's feasible. But, um, so that's kind of my product and my service in a nutshell. In terms of how does this differ from what labor contractors and what traditional immigration lawyers do? So a labor contractor is full stack. So they're going to go 
and recruit the workers for you. So the effort level from the farm is low. They don't have service levels, but they are doing recruitment and they're taking care of the day-to-day -day operations. They're housing the workers and they're charging you uh, a 50% fee and they're the employer of record. An immigration lawyer, uh, they will charge you instead of 50%, something like 20 to 30%. Um, but they're not recruiting the workers. They're just doing the paperwork for you. Uh, and you still have to be very involved in the process. Uh, and then with my company, I want to be focusing on keeping costs low and keeping the effort low from the farm. So I'm going to be recruiting the workers. I'm going to be automating the visa and taking care of all of that paperwork and that process. Um, but I'm not going to be the employer and I'm not going to be doing day to day operations. And that will allow me to charge a much lower fee than what labor contractors charge. So um, there was a recent court case that said if you're using a farm labor contractor to bring in workers, uh, you can't argue that they are the employer and you're not the employer. You guys are joint employers because they're picking your crops on your fields. So if there's a lawsuit, so for this visa, the visa says if you pick tomatoes, if your visa says I pick tomatoes and you pick an apple, then you can get you can get sued. So lawyers will actually come to the fields in Central Valley in California and ask the workers on, you know, when they're not working, hey, what's your visa say? Uh, what are you supposed to be doing? Well, you're not doing that today. So, you know, let's get a court case going or we already have a court case going, join our case. And that's that's a good thing. Accountability is a good thing. Um, but the farms have to always try to avoid being part of that by saying we're not the employer. That's no longer the case. They are joint employers. So it doesn't make sense to charge a con for, to pay a contractor a premium because they're the employer, because you're not, you're still liable at this point. Mm. Um, and so that's part of my value proposition is, mm. is keeping the cost low because I'm not adding value by pretending to be the only employer. Uh, and then from a social impact perspective, um, this is ethical employment. So a lot of, so by working with agriculture companies in Latin America and Mexico, um, I am working with people who employ workers and who are not going and, and finding random workers that labor recruiters do and then exploiting them when they come home. So a lot of labor recruiters will say, hey, go work over there. I'll help you get the visa. I'll connect you. But then when they come home, they expect to take 30, 40, 50 percent of their wages um, off the books. And they kind of and, and there's uh, there's a lot of unethical practicing practices with with uh, employment in, in this community. Um, so I'm trying to work with people where I know that's not going to be the case. Uh, the second is there is no way that the U.S. Uh, farming industry will survive without someone solving some of the labor problems. Um, so this is going to fill an essential need for the U.S. economy. And then I want to be supporting um, some of the bipartisan work around immigration reform. Uh, and, it, and this is a population that often crosses the border undocumented and goes through a very dangerous track. So by, by recruiting more of these workers, I'm, I'm giving them a legal option to get through and kind of avoid that dangerous track. So those are like the social impact layers to, to the company. And then you've seen some, we've seen similar models of these types of marketplaces with nursing, with warehouse, and these are for companies that I'm aware of, there's many more, um, and in restaurants. And some of the value adds are around cost savings, training, and screening of workers. And those are three of the value adds that are very important to, to me and how I think I'm going to differentiate my work from other uh, traditional contractors. And then just to show you a very quick demo, and this is not a live product. This is just kind of a simple prototype. Uh, so the farm would, the farmer would go to create an account. So his organization is Michael's Farm, Michael G. Uh, farmer, Stanford. <laughs> the farm. <laughs> all right. So we sign up, and I kind of have my value propositions and all that stuff here, and then. We're not going to save that fake password. Uh, and then they are filling out as little information as possible. So they're picking berries and they're picking, you know, fruits and vegetables. The job function is harvesting and packaging or reaping. Field supervisor, uh, you pick the dates. Number of workers, crew leads. Say 10 to 1 ratio, 10 to 1 ratio, special requests. I need good training. And then this would search my database, find the workers that fit that request, and say, hey, we do actually have these. Do you want to continue? And then whether or not we're going to be taking care of housing and transportation, or if they are, and then sharing the, the state and federal standards here. And then they oh, are. So that's one of your services? You, you would provide uh, so I would, housing? 
Um, so I would be, uh, the first one is I just connect you to a third party mar marketplace okay. you find it. The second one is I charge a premium and still, you know, in, in year one outsource it to, to mm -hmm. another party, but I'm making a margin off that. Mm -hmm. The third one is no, you get, you're taking care of it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then you fill in, you know, basic information. And I take the basic information that I need to fill out all of the forms for you. So this information goes through an API and then gets submitted directly to the different government agencies. Um, and like I said, this is not live, so we don't need to finish everything. Um, and then based on what's here, some of it's already pre-filled. And then from here, you're tracking at any point, the status of the applications and when you expect to get the workers uh, on site. And this is a very fast visa. So you can only apply 75 days before you need a worker and no later than 60 days. So you have a 15 day window to get the whole thing right. And then you want so to- So it's the employer that, that applies for the visa. So the employer can apply, the contractor can apply, the lawyer can apply, I can apply as an agent for the employer. Yeah. Okay, but not uh, individual. No, individuals are not doing this themselves. Okay. Unless they have a very close relationship with the farm and, and the farm is saying you're doing it for us okay. on behalf of okay. yourself, but that, that doesn't really happen. Uh, and then there's obviously a chatbot. Where is my people? Okay. Um, yeah, and that's it. Cool. Great. So what, and to what, what, so what's the business model? I mean, how you just uh, license the, I mean, yeah, uh, a subscription to the service or, how, or are you? No, great you question. Yeah. So, so traditionally, like I said, farm labor contractors are charging a 50% margin. They're ending, they're netting about 30%. So my model would be to charge a 20% margin and net 15%. So if a worker is coming in and, and the state sets the wage, so this is not something that me or the farm would set. And the state says, hey, you know, based on the work that you're doing, the crops that you're picking in the state minimum wage, you're making $18 an hour. And over a four month period, you're making $10,000. And I'd say, hey, the worker gets 10,000. On top of that, I get 2,000. And then after my costs, I'm netting 1,500. So for me to hit a million ARR, which is kind of generally as a start of your first revenue target, I need to bring in 640 workers. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. So yeah. Not a lot. So for context, there's 280,000 workers in 2019 that are 2018 that got the visa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So like I have a pilot with 70 workers starting in January. So that's my deadline to build the tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I but I've talked to farms that say, hey, we bring in thousands of workers every year, and we mm -hmm. would bring in more if we had contractors that that charged us less. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I didn't go into great detail on, but is a very big problem is housing specifically in California. So the difference between working with an undocumented worker and working with someone on this visa is if someone comes in on this visa, just like, I don't know, I, I was a former consultant. When they send you abroad, they house you, right? You get a fancy hotel somewhere. So when someone comes in on this visa, you need to house them. You don't need to house an, un, uh, an undocumented worker. So that's the biggest cost difference. But the actual wage is the same, whether you're hiring an American, an undocumented immigrant, or someone on this visa. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way they're willing to pay the premiums on the wage, the housing is the issue. So in the, in California, uh, two, an hour South of San Jose is where you have all of the big farms and the housing costs are like 70% of what San Jose's housing is. So it's one of the most expensive ag housing or like kind of non city housing in, in the country. Uh, so I'm trying to also find turnkey solutions for solving the housing issues. So, and think outside the box there. So for example, there's military barracks that are unused there, like <laughs> tons of them, uh, probably a little complicated, but you know. Uh, yeah, down in Gilroy, the Gilroy area? So yeah, yeah, in, Mon in Monterey County, just oh, okay. there's mm -hmm. a lot of housing. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so, so like whoever solves the housing problem uh, in, in, in those towns um, can make the most money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, okay, so on one hand, you need the, the US far farmers are gonna be your customers. On the other hand, you need to find uh, the workers, yeah. um, and uh, and you said you're partnering with local companies yeah. there. Some of which may be doing this already, and so you might be. None of them are doing of... this right now. So I so I so I went down to Mexico a month ago, and I met with this like with many CEOs of like small farms and medium-sized farms, and I ended up having three people say we're 100 percent in. Like the, when they saw the delta, so so a farm worker in. Uh, in the U.S. gets 10x more than what a farm worker in Mexico gets. Um, so 
they know that if they're lending me their workers for a period of time that doesn't affect their business and we're doing a rev share that that that's great for their business it's great for their business in two ways one is um, it's easier for them to recruit the best workers to their farm so if there's three blueberry farms in mexico and one guy says hey blueberry season is january to march but from april to june instead of going to another part of the country and picking potatoes i will help you go to california and pick blueberries and pick 10x mm -hmm. Uh, but you come back to my farm uh, for my season, right? So like that's the type of arrangement that helps you get the best uh, mm -hmm. the best workers. Uh, so so that was kind of what I discussed in some of these farms and they were pretty excited about that opportunity. And it's very different than the traditional labor recruiter model. And you're training them. Yeah. yeah. Well, tra so, so, so ideally I am getting people that have the right experience and I'm training them on the, the difference between farming in the US and pesticides and safety stuff that doesn't exist in a lot of these emerging market countries. Um, but I would also need to train, let's say I can't find enough blueberry workers to, to work on the blueberry fields. Then there would need to be a training on how do you pick this crop versus the past experience you have. But, but matching people with the right crop to crop experience is the best way to keep your customer satisfied. And then, and then worker retention is also another issue. So if you're, if you're housing people well, you're treating them well, you're giving them good wages, you're training them, uh, they're going to want to come back to work with you and to work with the farms that you work with. And that's a huge issue with farms is they don't ex expect to see a lot of the same workers again. Um, so, so that's kind of why I want to invest in those types of uh, initiatives, even though they're going to be, they're going to cost more up front. Any more questions for Michael? Anyone here in the group? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's Bruce Cahan. Hi, this is awesome. Um, I wonder, so you could actually create banking services for these unbanked workers. You could actually, um, without Bitcoin, um, do some pretty creative savings, investment, um, insurance mm -hmm. programs, not sponsored by the farmers, but sponsored by other groups, because now you have the identity of the farm worker who is yeah. legal and you can have them seasonally each year so you can actually offer that range of financial security to these workers yeah absolutely i mean so the the, the bitcoin reference is a bit opportunistic because a friend of mine has the biggest bitcoin exchange in mexico and so he's done work with remittance companies before where he's giving a better rate than a bank because and, and the worker is not being is not <clears throat> being told hey we're buying and selling bitcoin with your with, with what you're giving us we're just going to guarantee that we're going to, um, you know, we're going to do the transaction for them. But but the exchange rate just ha ends up being preferential. If I can work with a bank that gives me a better rate than Bitcoin, then by all means. There's a there's another there's another company I came across. Forget the name, but they are basically setting up uh, financial services, Bitcoin, uh, blockchain backed uh, financial services systems for. Um, for refugee camps and things like that oh. in in um, in Africa, and uh, and part of their uh, selling point is that they can make you know keep the costs very very low. Uh, I'll I'll look it up. I'll find yeah. out and I can connect you with these guys. I mean, uh, and, they're and pretty successful. That is also what Facebook is trying to argue. They're doing with Libra, right? Is is to just yeah. be able to give yeah. anyone who has a smartphone access to currency into almost right. you know, virtual banking. Right, yeah, that's a good idea to kind of leverage that too for your service. Um, cool, any any more, I think you had a question, yeah, did you? Yeah, uh, Do you keep the name of the different um, famous that you have or not in order to create a, a sort of social famous network in order to increase the network between famous and employees and to make perhaps a sort of uh, Libra or become <laughs> the guesser or I um, don't know. You, so you're asking like how much information am I keeping yeah. on the workers yeah. and am I going to add yeah. a social aspect to it? Yeah, for uh, the network and for next um, season or I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. So, so traditionally farm workers do not put their names on registrations on anything because traditionally that's undocumented population and they're worried about uh, getting in trouble or uh you know getting deported because these are all visa workers where all their information is with the government i want to be not only 
keeping track of their names and creating a database, but creating a profile and getting feedback from the foreman on which workers are the highest performing and then give those workers preferential uh, choice on what farms they want to work for or vice versa, giving farms a premium uh, for, for the workers that had the highest ratings and then potentially selling that performance data as well. Um, that's a, a vision that's not like a, a, a MVP product. Uh, in terms of a social network, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's quite interesting, maybe. Interesting idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, great. Thank you, Mike. It's been uh, uh, super interesting. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully um, keep, keep us in the loop on your progress, please. I would, I would love to. Uh, all right, then uh, over to Francesco. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Give me a second to uh, start video. I cannot start video. Uh, let me see. One second. Um, I guess you have to. Start. I need to. So I stopped sharing. You need and to I'm, stop. And I'm unmuted. Okay, Is there anything so. else I need to do? Uh, um, no, no, you can. Oh, yeah. Oh, he yeah, talks for you. <laughs> there you are. And I will. Turn off Michael's video. Yeah, yeah perfect. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, all right. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a little bit excited to be here. Uh, anyway, good afternoon, everybody. Um, th um, thank you for being here and for listening. And uh, for this opportunity to talk uh, uh, about my research project on um, automatic explanations of explainable systems. That is supervised by, uh, is a PhD project and is supervised by professors Fabio, Fabio Vitali and Marco Rocetti. Anyway, uh, first of all, um, let me introduce myself. I'm Francesco, Francesco Sovrano. I'm a PhD student in data science and computation uh, at the University of Bologna. And I'm currently working uh, with Professor uh, Monica Palmirani and Sirfield on several projects, um, including Mirel and uh, Yunga Resolutions, that is a project uh, for United Nations. And I would like to thank both for this opportunity of being here in Stanford and having this uh, presentation. Uh, anyway, during this presentation, I will introduce the background information uh, required to understand the problem of explaining explainable systems. And, uh, I will, um, and I will propose a solution that is our project. And I will talk about how this project works. And uh, then I will show some significant use cases of the project. Um, okay, now let's start with background information. This is going to be short, I hope. Um, we know that algorithmic decision making, uh, also known as ADM, is currently changing industry. And uh, ADM has been widely used in the legal domain and providing many benefits. And uh, we have seen some examples before in the presentation before, uh, and some potential examples. This is, my, this is why people and countries anyway started to be concerned about the impact that ADM may have on everyone's lives. Um, as a consequence, uh, we have the um, right to explanation that has become a hot topic in this field, also because of the GDPR that is um, in, introduced, has been introduced in, in the European Union legislation and the code of conduct adopted in the AI market. Uh, but many tools based on ADM are not compliant at all with the right to explanation because of the underlying technology uh, being still too, too obscure, is very uh, obscure uh, black box to be explainable in a human-friendly way. Um, here, uh, here comes explainable artificial intelligence and uh, XAI uh, for short. Uh, XAI is a subfield of AI that practically studies how to make ADM explainable. Um, there are many transparent by design te XAI techniques and uh, uh, most of them, at least a big part of them, uh, consists in uh, learning rules describing the ADM model. Uh, for example, you see uh, DeepMind's uh, recent technique for differentiable inductive logic programming. Um, anyway, um, it is worth mentioning uh, that uh, current research uh, on ADM is more focused on the techniques of the machine learning field rather than the most static and human engineered decision, decision structures of legal, legal expert systems. And I'm citing Vogel now uh, because today little attention is given to the possibilities of using predefined rules based on 
deductive and ontological reasoning techniques that are the main techniques underlying the legal expert systems as a means for explaining ABM processes. And this is why an explainable system actually wouldn't imply uh, user-friendly or also meaningful explanations. Uh, for example, some explainable systems are very hard to understand, even for an expert. Uh, you know, a software, for example, is made of rules, is a collection of rules uh, written in a formal language, and it is explainable in principle, but it can be still super hard to be explained, and we know it for sure. And this is why we came up with our project about automatic explanations of explainable systems. Um, explainable, uh, able, implies potentiality, you know, able, uh, not reality. And we need an explainer. Uh, the explainer, uh, as you can see in the, in the slide, uh, it lies in the middle between explainable information and the end user knowledge. An explainer uh, should be, is a system that generates an explanation out of, uh, um, out of explainable intelligible systems. Uh, an explanation is a digital thing that explains a com uh, complex concept, a data set or a process. And uh, we say that an explainable ADM produces an explainable data set. Uh, and uh, um, our, explaining, uh, our explainer aims to explain uh, explainable data sets and also explainable systems or processes and the explanation itself. And, uh, um, but how does it work? Uh, the end user defines implicitly or explicitly some constraints in the form of uh, physical limitations, you know, uh, maybe is colorblind or whatever, knowledge gaps and uh, assert uncertainty of purposes. And the user might want to explore the space of explanations uh, in order to find the ones it needs. But the whole, the whole space uh, might be very, very intractable, uh, the whole space of, uh, space of explanations to fully explore, especially without a tool like the explainer. Um, the explainer has to elicitate the user mental model in order to engage it and help it finding an optimal explanation that would fit its, uh, its needs. And we put emphasis on the exploration of the explanation space. Uh, thus, what is the best data structure uh, for uh, knowledge considered the explorative task? Um, okay, this is a question and we think that uh, knowledge graphs uh, is the answer. And we know that knowledge graphs include uh, RDF graphs and that RDF graphs can be used for semantic graphs. And what we want to do is, is to exploit RDF technology like ontologies, linked open data, and etc. And this way we can provide grounds, sources, and easily uh, extend explanations uh, exploring neighboring knowledge. Um, but what are the qualities of a good explanation? Um, Another question, and try to answer this question, we came up with the SAGES model. SAGES stands for simple, adaptable, grounded, expandable, and sourced. Um, let's look on, on it. Uh, simple means that the explanation has to be simple to process and understand. Uh, adaptable means that it is tailored to the end user knowledge and must be able to adapt accordingly. Uh, end user knowledge may change uh, during, uh, during um, the exploration uh, of uh, an explanation. Uh, grounded means that the explanation has to be uh, cons consistent with the explained data. And expandable means that it can be arbitrarily enriched with details about the data domain and other related domains. Um, and we are going to see with some examples. Uh, source means that we want to be able to understand on which local inputs, or let's say sources, the explanation has been defined. And this last property is very important because it allows the end user to build counterfactual explanations. Um, uh, now some use cases. Um, we can apply the Sages model to get explanations of uh, a lot of things, um, but in this case, knowledge graphs and rule-based ADMs, such as divisible or normal rule bases, uh, smart contracts and uh, blockchains, uh, XAI based on rule extraction, and uh, more or less all the rule-based uh, um, systems. Uh, I'm going to show you a significant uh, use case scenario on a divisible rule base.
Um, in this scenario, we have Marco, that uh, is a 14 years old Italian teenager that lives in Italy. And Marco frequently uses WhatsApp, and his father is Giulia. Giulia wants WhatsApp to remove Marco's profile because Marco is a minor and is worried about Marco's privacy. And uh, WhatsApp uses an automated system for deciding case by case. And Marco is a European citizen. But uh, deciding what case by case? What, sorry? What, what is uh, WhatsApp deciding case by case? No, oh, I mean, uh, the. Um, that should get. Uh, yeah, when they be allowed how to resolve the, the, the dispute, I would say, is a dispute. Between uh, the Mark, uh, Giulio, and his son? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, Marco, your example, the father goes to WhatsApp to ask to terminate the son. Yeah, and the son and doesn't the, want... He doesn't ask the son to close his account. Yeah, the son, the son <laughs> doesn't want to... Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, the son doesn't want to close his, uh, his, his, okay. his account. And, uh, yeah. And uh, Julia uh, demanded it to WhatsApp somehow. Okay, and, I see. Okay. Um, um, WhatsApp had, has to um, to solve this uh, okay. this dispute, and he uses uh, it uses an automated system for that. Got it. And um, we are uh, we know. Uh, and in order to do it, he analyzes the uh, the contents, the premises, and the premises are that Marco is a European citizen, also an Italian citizen. And the GDPR, uh, that is the uh, General Data Protection uh, uh, Rules, defines that a minor with at least 16 years old can consent autonomously to the Information Society services. Uh, but the, uh, there is an Italian decree uh, that overrides the standard GDPR rule, permitting to at least 14 years old to provide consent and manage the self profile. And uh, we can see. Is that, is that a fact? Is this a fact or is it? Yeah, yeah. I know that's a fact. How can an Italian rule override a uh, EU regulation? Yeah, uh, I think uh, I don't uh, know in detail the uh, okay. the GDPR, but I think that uh, at least the seat member can uh, somehow um, um, uh, modify changes with okay. particular aspects of the of the rules. Uh, okay. In order to uh, okay. to be more, I don't yeah. Know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't want to <laughs> sort of uh, besides your your point, anyways. So. <laughs> uh, oh, don't worry. And uh, yeah, we can see the rule base. Um, anyway, WhatsApp decides to use, uh, for example, uh, le a legal rule uh, NL for modeling the rule base, and uh, it uses Pindo, uh, a defeasible logic reasoner, to reason about the rule base. And the spindle conclusions are shown in, on the slide. Uh, maybe to I can zoom. I can zoom. Uh, um, and both the conclusions, and the premises, and the rule base are said to be our data. And uh, now uh, here comes uh, our explainer. And, uh, and WhatsApp clerk, uh, WhatsApp's clerk uses the explainer on the provided provided data. And uh, uh, the first level result is the first uh, orangish uh, uh, block. And uh, uh, of the explainer is about the data. And it is a too shallow explaining, explanation indeed. And uh, um, thus, the clerk uh, clicks on, uh, on the More button uh, and uh, um, showing more information. That is the second block, uh, orangish block. Now we see that the data is composed by a set of logical conclusions and the hierarchy of rules used to get those conclusions and the premises on which the rules have been applied. And uh, this is how our data is composed. Uh, and uh, uh, if we want to see more details about uh, uh, the rules, we can click on the corresponding more button. Um, does we have that every rule is granted to a, a legal rule ML uh, for space reasons I just uh, Left the button, but if you click the ground button, you can see that the that's, that's uh, for example, rule one is a, a ground uh, grounded to a uh, uh, legal rule uh, uh, XML uh, piece of uh, piece of XML, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, um, and it's linkable also to the pertinent source of load, and uh, uh, we can also see rebuttals. Uh, this is an important part, I, I would say. And if we click on the explain button, uh, I already did it, 
uh, mm, corresponding to a rebuttal, the uh, last one. Uh, R three reboots are true. Uh, we can uh, we can find out that uh, the Lex Specialis deroga generali uh, is applied. Uh, furthermore, we might change these rules and the rebuttals too uh, in order to be counterfactual explanations, for example. Um, okay, well, let's do a simple uh, a little digression uh, on complex explanations. Um, because the text generated for an explanation tells of specific paths within the dataset, and they can be direct, alternative, or superimposed. Uh, there is not just uh, only one single explanation of the whole complex process. Uh, you may have uh, a lot of them. And explanation is not simply coloring or decorating a true skeleton uh, and information. Uh, explanation is a process itself, and uh, we can explore this process. We can expand the explanation in a lot of ways, some of which are not non-trivial, like rebuttals, or for example, uh, let's think about alternatives. Uh, if we look at the set of premises, uh, that's clicking, uh, uh, yeah, we, let's assume, we click on the last button and then we click on the more button again, and uh, uh, we see the, the set of premises, and uh, uh, one, two, three, we have X is called Marco, is the first uh, premise, X is 13 years old, is the second premise, and so on. And, uh, and we, we find that some of them uh, can, can allow alternative versions. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, um, these alternatives, if we click on them, uh, uh, we can see that, uh, for example, if uh, uh, Marco's father uh, moves to Luxembourg, considering that in Luxembourg the lower limit applicable for autonomous consent is 16 years old, uh, if Marco's family goes to Luxembourg for, I think, three or more months, European judge uh, evaluates his situation uh, um, on, and the limit applicable in Luxembourg is 16 uh, years old, the lower limit. Does uh, Marco, uh, Marco's father can remove the profile? And this is an example of counterfactual explanation because uh, the, um, uh, the alternative change in alternatives uh, can uh, allow us to uh, understand uh, how we can uh, change and modify uh, the, uh, the, uh, the environment, the, the data, according in order to get an explanation, in order to uh, change the result of our. Um, uh, of our um, ADM, uh, automatic decision, algorithmic decision making. And, uh, um, okay, some conclusions now. Um, for this presentation, uh, we have decided to focus more on explanations for uh, legal, legal documents uh, written in any language, natural or formal, and rule-based uh, XAI. And our MVP is going to be a working prototype of the explainer of smart contracts. Uh, we have just started, uh, and, and this is my first PhD year, uh, I have three more years in front of me. But anyway, we are using natural language processing for extracting knowledge graphs, and uh, natural language understanding for mapping knowledge graphs to one or more isomorphic RDF graphs, and deep reinforcement learning for um, uh, mental model elicitation, elicitation, and assisted exploration of the explanation space. And uh, we think that explainable data sets and processes uh, need to produce statements that can be rendered to human readers and can be made simple, adaptable, grounded, expandable, and so on. And uh, this is the, uh, okay, this, that's the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. My internet has gone away, probably. <laughs> you don't have internet connection anymore? No. No, no. Oh, it's, it froze, so Sometimes. we have to, like, sometimes the guest network can be a bit finicky. Oh, it's Edurom. Oh, no, then go on Stanford Visitor. Go on Stanford. Oh. The Edurom is always problematic. Okay, okay. Well, well, uh, like sometimes it is. But so this is so, this is for ADM, ADM systems that are rule based, or also ADM systems, systems that use statistical. AI to make automated decisions. Okay, uh, you say okay. Um, I think that uh, the problem here, um, and I understand that the 
to do the explanations, you mm -hmm. need a rule-based system. Yeah, uh, so that I guess. But the, yeah. I thought that one thing you said initially was that mm -hmm. this only works for systems where the automatic decision automatic decision making is based on specific rules. Yeah, um, I, I would say this is true. But uh, explainable AI comes with uh, uh, sort of tools, some tools that uh, can. Um, Extract rules from also from uh, uh, you know deep learning models and oh, okay. machine learning models. Uh, oh, it is not so easy because you know you have a lot of fuzzy rules and the uh, uh, space uh, the the rules uh, um, space uh, is closed exponentially. Uh, okay. According to the depending to the depth of the of the okay. of the model, but uh, you can still build rules uh, from uh, uh, from a, um, a deep learning model, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, okay, uh, this project. Project wants uh, to come uh, um, right after uh, XAI, explainable AI, because we think that explainable AI is going to succeed somehow sooner or later in this uh, 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 thing of uh, making uh, deep learning explainable somehow. Uh, and uh, um, this project uh, tries to uh, exploit this uh, uh, um, idea of the future that could be. And we want to. Um, to exploit explainable systems and uh, mm -hmm. uh, those based on uh, rule based, uh, because we know they are not the only uh, type of uh, uh, explainable systems. Uh, we also have the prototype based ones that are a little bit different because we have prototypes uh, use cases and uh, you can uh, somehow uh, lazily infer uh, reason about the, um, the whole process instead of providing a set of rules, uh, um, a global explanation. You provide or a local tool. Uh, you provide a, a set of uh, prototypes uh, and uh, that are going to explain. Uh, it's more close to the counterfactual explanations. Mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, um, it is possible to extract rules from uh, deep learning models. It's uh, unfeasible uh, usually. Uh, it's not simple, and uh, there are tools for doing it. Uh, uh, um, I think also in the bibliography uh, I've started uh, one of them. And uh, uh, but um, this project wants to come later. Mm -hmm. Got a question. Well, this is regarding the law, right? The law, Italy law, uh -huh. is clear about its standard, right? It uh, says that if age is so and so, then you can permit a profile on our social media network. So there was a teenager in UK who sued Facebook uh, for selling his data, and he won the lawsuit. So the law on privacy is very clear, right? So this, uh, where is the NLP or AI part on this? Because you could have asked a question, is the consumer above 18? Yes, uh -huh. then permit. If it is below, if no, then delete the profile or send the profile to uh, the secondary inspection. So where is the AI or deep learning part when the law is very clear? And you could basically, instead of deep learning, you know the law, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're over 18, you, you can. If not, then you cannot. Or you need a parental consent, right? So, how, what is the AI or deep learning part here? Okay, here we are trying to exploit uh, RDF, RDF technology. And um, okay, if we have a data set, a set of information that is structured somehow or partially structured, and um, we still do not have this is explainable. We still uh, do not. We cannot uh, um, automatize. Uh, um, most of the explanation uh, is, is explaining process because uh, we have to map this uh, knowledge graph we uh, already have to our RDF graph, and this is not uh, trivial at all. Uh, we have to, uh, um, you know, uh, RDF is um, is built upon ontologies, and you have this uh, concept of the triples, and you have uh, every uh, triples of subject, predicate, and and uh, uh, object, and each uh, component of the triple has to be a URI, a uniform resource identifier, and that uh, specifically identify um, uh, a resource. For example, if we are talking about uh, Barack Obama, Barack Obama may be uh, the president of the United States, but we don't know it for sure. Uh, uh, the computer does not know it for sure, and the computer has to disambiguate this uh, Barack Obama term in order to understand what is the uh, the meaning of the con the, the content of the on the input. And uh, this is not always trivial. Uh, sometimes you have to, um, you know, uh, um, I don't think it's taught completely automatic automatic. Um, 
it is possible to completely automatize it. Uh, you need somehow the intervention of a, a, a human. What we want to do is to assist this human in order to facilitate his uh, everyday life, for example, and in order to uh, um, his work, and in order to also uh, to provide uh, some explanation that are um, uh, somehow that follows that follow stand, a standard. Uh, we want to build this kind uh, or not build. We want to um, somehow. Uh, work around and uh, on this and uh, uh, provide a solid tool for explaining uh, for explanation for exploring the explanation space because you may have a lot of uh, information too much is maybe overwhelmed you uh, you came up with a very simple like, example but you may have very complex examples as well and uh, uh, we are trying to face this kind of so if you have unstructured data and you, you put it into your system that you're no uh, yeah that is is going to be the next yeah uh, the unstructured data for example the legal document right, right. yeah you have to uh map it into a knowledge graph okay. and, and then you have to map the knowledge data. graph to a rdf graph if possible uh, using the, um, the user the end user and um and what what the graph may be too big for a user you cannot to overwhelm the user with all that information and you have us to assist him and exploring possibly uh, us making some assumption on his background knowledge possibly yeah when possible and this assumption may facilitate the exploration of the process of exploring your okay. so you mentioned nlp for extracting that knowledge graph can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that and okay you know example? about the uh, open information extraction is a uh, field of NLP and it's something about, uh, but it's very simple. There are a lot of uh, prototypes around and um, you have a lot of possibilities. One of the most simple, I think, is uh, it's called Closy and uh, it's about uh, extracting uh, tri triples in the form of subject, verb, and object. And uh, you use you can use the dependency parser for doing this. And uh, uh, this is not always easy because you always have to disambiguate and the dependency parser uh, plays an important role in this. But this is a kind of knowledge uh, graph extraction, and um, and this is the first step. And then you have to understand the content of this graph in order to uh, build the RDF RDF graph. Uh, yeah. I can provide you some. Yeah. Great. Well, is there are there any more questions? We're pretty much at the end of our time. But if there's one more question, and either here in the room or online, please uh, go ahead. So, Roland, I, I just put in the chat that it sounds like Codex needs to start tracking how the courts are handling the explainable or unexplainable AI that they're going to run into as they're trying to deal with the automation of government and corporate decisions like insurance, like banking, like uh, government benefits. So. We, we may need to or want to start, if we have an intern or whatever, figuring out how are the courts deciding what is an explainable AI and what is a non-explainable uh, useless AI? Yeah, no, I think that would be a worthwhile undertaking. <laughs> any volunteers? <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, great. Uh, any any other questions? Oh. This was Bruce, and by the way, if uh, Bruce Cahan. Um, so if um, uh, both uh, you, Michael, and Francesco, you could just uh, put your contact information in the in the chat, sure. uh, so uh, folks could reach out to you directly if they have any more uh, questions or they see any interesting collaboration opportunities for you. Uh, that'd be the the best way to reach you. That would be great. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Francesco, thank you, Michael. It's been great to have you. Um, this is, uh, as I said, this is our only uh, session this summer. We'll pick it up again uh, uh, sometime in September. So stay tuned. We'll send out an email and announce our next uh, speakers. Um, thank you for coming and really, and stay cool. <laughs> mm -hmm.